By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are starting something exciting because we are starting the Raging Bull series tournament report. And this is the first episode and I'm going to show you the matches played from round number one. This is round number one all the way up to the finals. And this is an event that I'm always very excited about because it's organized by one of my best magic friends, Richard. And also it's organized in Amsterdam, my hometown. This is just 10 minutes from where I live in my favorite Magic the Gathering pub, the Twee Klaveren. It's my favorite place to hang out, drink a beer, play some magic. You know, all sorts of, you know, different old school formats are being played here. It's just, it's just a lot of fun. And once a year, this place explodes and there are over 70 wizards in this small little pub playing magic today. So it's just going to be really exciting. And in this first round, we have two Dutch players, Jeff versus Roy. And Jeff is playing... Uh, blue white mid-range pretty good deck he's taking on the role you also brought a very fierce deck to the table this is a dead guy ale version with a fireball so it's called dead guy ale on fire so i'm uh, curious to see if that fireball is going to play uh, a role in this match now before i start with the deck decks I, i've got lovely deck photos of both of these decks i would first like to point out that as always you can also choose to first go uh to the match and check out the deck decks later the easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. And in that same description below, you can also find a link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Because yes, yes, I have my very own Patreon program. So if you're enjoying the content that I make, please consider becoming a sponsor of the show and check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Okay, and now that you're fully informed, I'm going to start with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with Jeff and his blue-white mid-range deck. And here we see the deck of Jeff. So it's mainly blue and white. It's got two black cards. Guess which one they are? <laughs> Guess. Okay, it's a Demonic Tutor and Mind Twist, of course. I think we're going to see lists like this a lot today. Blue-white is very popular. And people kind of are stepping away from the blue-white control. Uh, you know, of course, you can build the deck, which is more than just blue-white, obviously. But that's the most famous control deck with, where those colors play a main role. Um, but a lot of people are kind of changing it to a more creature-heavy format, and that's uh, this is that as well. We see Savannah Lines full playset. We see three Surrender Befreets. We see three Sarah Angels. We see the Swedish old All-Star Suchi here, also a full playset. So just a lot of creatures in this deck, and I think that's one of the things that makes this deck so much fun to play because you just you play out your creatures. It's it's combat heavy. You turn them sideways, and then at the same time you have that control package where you don't really have to worry about your opponent. Because because you've got your disenchant, you've got your swords. If need be, this deck also has two power sinks to counter some stuff away, and of course a mana drain as well. So it's it's really you've you've got that safety, and I think um, the intention of this deck can can best be illustrated by the fact of a card that's not in this deck, and that is Gem Day Tome. GM Day Tome, an absolute all-star in, of course, white-blue control decks, it's not in here. So this also showing that if you play this type of blue-white deck. Your intention is more aggressive. It's not as controlling. It's controlling because you can play that game with these cards as well, but not as controlling and not as much uh, reliant of card advantage that, for example, the deck is, right? So this is a more aggressive strategy. And I'm actually, I'm liking this, I think, at a tournament. It's also kind of, uh, you know, a tournament where we play, I think, six rounds in the Swiss here. So it's going to be a long day. I think a deck like this, makes sense and uh, yeah jeff you definitely brought strong cards here to the table um just just a little elaboration on the suchi why is that a swedish all-star just a reminder in swedish magic there's no mana burn so of course this is a four 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 which is really good stats but if you destroy it you get four mana when you play with mana burn you cannot use that mana you don't have a mana sink you take four damage. A good mana sink, by the way, is, are those uh, Mishra's factories there on the board. But that, of course, makes Suchi really popular in Swedish because there is no mana burn. Now, in my experience, whenever I play with Suchi, it gets killed so quickly because it's an artifact and a creature. That combination makes it very vulnerable. Shatter can kill it. Crumble can kill it. Disenchant can kill it. But also any other like creature removal can kill it, except for the Terror and the Abyss. So it's immune to that. So you see some players now kind of not even 
Well, they're still playing it main a lot, but some players are choosing to play it side and put it in from the sideboard when they play against, for example, the Abyss. Okay, so this is the deck of Jeff. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, and that is Roy. And here we see the deck of Roy. So this is, of course, a Dead Guy Ill deck, and Dead Guy Ill refers to the two colors, white and black. And what I love about this deck is the third color. This may seem odd because there are only four uh, cards in here with another color than black and white, which is the four red cards, Wheel of Fortune, Lightning Bolt, two Lightning Bolts, and of course one Fireball. But what I love here is that Roy didn't go for the obvious route, which is let's add some blue power. And that adding blue power makes perfect sense, don't get me wrong, but I'm just excited to see something else. You know what I mean? Like no Ancestral Recall, no Time Walk, no Time Twister, no. Roy is choosing to go in another direction. And I kind of like that direction. I think this deck is so aggressive that, you know, burn can be quite good because you've got a lot of aggressive creatures and then to finish it with burn, that can work. Also, I like that lightning bolt early game. Like if you have Hypnotic Spectre and your opponent manages to get some kind of blocker in the way, you can get rid of it with bolt. You can keep attacking with your hippie and you can force your opponent to discard some stuff. So I, I, I kind of li uh, like that. And I think in general, when I'm looking at this list, I think Roy had to make a lot of tough decisions. And I wonder also how much playtesting went before taking this deck to the tournament. And the reason I'm saying that is that I see a lot of three offs, I see some two offs, I see a one off. And that always kind of, you know, must have been must have been tough. For example, like how many dark rituals are you gonna play? Right? So we see three in this deck. So that must have been the decision. We don't see a drain life, which in a way makes sense because you're playing three colors. On the other hand, you can make a lot of black mana. So again, that's one of those decisions. There simply are not enough slots for all the great options that you have when you're playing black, white, and you splash red. There are just, they're just so many slots. And, and also, I like the, the single Sangir Vampire. I'm sure he, he built versions where he had maybe two or three Sangir Vampires. It's not a really strong card. Um, I love the fact that with other creatures, he made the decision not to cut. He just he set the full playset. Like, for example, we have four Hypnotic Spectres. For obvious reasons, the card is, is still so incredibly good. It's just so good. And then he also plays with four Juzum Jins, which I really love. I mean, he's just going for it. When you play Juzum, it's also an indication of the type of magic player you are. You're saying, you know what? This is a 5-5 five, five for 4. I don't care about sitting in a bottle. I don't care about Maze of If. I'm just going to slam this creature on the table. I'm going to turn it sideways. You've got four turns and then you're dead, right? It's like a message you're sending to your opponent. And of course, talking about Maze, he is playing with sinkholes. But look at that. Also, three sinkholes. So he's kind of shaving off certain play sets, I think, to create space for other cards, right? We see Underworld Dreams, not four, but three, right? Dark Ritual, like I said, not four, but three. Sinkhole, not four, but three. And with other cards, he hasn't made that decision. He's playing four Swords to Plowshares, so he's expecting a lot of creatures at this tournament, I guess, which I think is a, is, is a right expectation. And he's playing with four Disenchants. Again, artifacts are always a big deal, so having a Disenchant is good. And the fact that you can choose between enchantment and artifact is really good. We see then those Divine Offerings in the sideboard, by the way, so you can always board those in if he's playing, for example, against the Robots deck and he wants to take care of some artifacts and gain some life in the process. So yeah, overall, this is just a very strong and aggressive deck. And, and what I love here about this list and what I love about Jeff's list is they're creature heavy. So that means we're just, we're in for a lot of fun. I think we're in for a lot of creature battle, combat action. And that's one of the, one of the main things I love about Magic is that combat step. So I'm really looking forward to that. So this is the list of Roy. We discussed the list of Jeff. So that only means one thing. We are ready for round number one of the Raging Bull series. Here we go. Game number one. Here we go. So we've got Jeff sitting on the left. He's playing uh, blue, white, mid-range with a little bit of uh, a black splash. And he's taken a mulligan. And on the right, we have Jeff who's playing Dead Guy Ale on fire. So he splashed red in there. So white, black, and red. And he's on the draw in this uh, match. Look at this. Two Moxon by Jeff. Demonic Tutor, probably going to go for a Time Twister, right, just to go back up to 7 again, or of course for an Ancestral Recall, or did he already have the Time Twister in hand, is he now looking up for a duel so he can cast it? I kind of feel like, I mean, he hasn't had a land drop, right, so probably going to look up a land, that makes more sense, especially if he has a Time Twister already in hand, I believe I did see a blue card there, so it could be one of the power pieces. Yeah, it's gonna go for the Tundra. It's gonna, ooh, Ancestral Recall, wow. That is insane. 
That is a really good start. Remember, he took a mulligan, but that's all compensated now thanks to that ancestral recall in the opener and, of course, the demonic that helped him to find uh, the blue mana source that he needed to cast the ancestral recall. Here we see a soul ring. And by the way, uh, Roy only played out of Batlands past the turn. A lot of mana sources now, though, in hand for Jeff. Playing a Savannah Lions passing the turn. Quick bolt, though, on end step here by Roy, taking care of the Lion. There we see a City of Brass. Gonna take a damage. Are we gonna see a Black Knight? Black Knight can be quite useful against all the sorts of plowshares. No, we're gonna see a Sinkhole and a pass turn. There's a Psionic Blast in hand, so not a lot of action actually for Jeff. He had a great opener, but now it's kind of dried up. There's a Swamp, so three is kind of a magic number for uh, for Roy. It opens up Hypnotic Spectre, Underworld Dreams, cards like that. Tapping one, it seems. A little bit in the tank here. I do believe I also see a Sinkhole in hand. It's going to go for the Soul Ring, tapping four. Are we going to see a Juzam Jin? That would be spectacular. Yep, Juzam hitting the board. 5-5 five, five Powerhouse. So pressure is on now. If you're Jeff, you really want to get the Sword Supply Shares here to take care of the Juzam. Passing the turn. So here's another damage, of course, for Roy from his own Juzam. There's the attack. Juzam in action. 15 now. And uh, Jeff is in trouble here in game number one, round number one of the Raging Bull series. And I wonder now if you're Roy, if you have another Juzam, for example, in hand, if you would play it out or not. You also have to think about a potential balance, for example. There we see a Chaos Orb and a pass. And look at that, another mana source for Jeff. Yeah, this is not really what he's hoping for. He's got a Disenchant in hand, a Psionic Blast, and a land. There's the attack, dropping to 10. Another Mox for Roy. No extra pressure on the board. It seems two cards in hand for him, I believe. So after that strong opener by Jeff, uh, nothing. Uh, there wasn't really a follow-up. Ooh, there's a Balance, though. So Balance can take care of the Juzam. And I guess he's considering playing a Psionic Blast on the life total of Roy, then playing the balance, because then he doesn't have to discard anything. He's got four cards in hand, I believe, and Roy, I believe two cards in hand, not 100% sure. Did he already have a land drop, though? He could just go City of Brass, play balance. Then again, he's going to lose some lands there as well. Is it that bad to lose your City of Brass, though? To discard it or lose it because it's on the table? It's gonna tap three. What are we gonna see? Okay, so there's a Psionic Blast. Interesting, gonna Psionic Blast here. Oh yeah, on, on Roy. For a moment there, I thought he was doing it on the Juzam. I'm like, why would you do that? So gonna go on the Juzam, and then he's probably gonna cast uh, the balance here. I assume at least. Or is he gonna disenchant? Is he gonna try to empty his hand? That's even better, actually. Yeah, that's, of course, way better. Disenchant on the Soul Ring, not on the Chaos Orb. And now he's going to balance. So now it's a Mind Twist and a Wrath of God in one. Yeah, this is really well played by Jeff. Really well played, because now you're discarding Roy's hand as well. So even if he kept a creature in hand against a balance scenario, he has to discard. Look at that. Yeah, so he kept a Juice M in hand, just in case he would run into... A balance scenario, but it didn't help him. Just uh, one card from the top for Roy in a pass. So both players now in top decking mode. Quite an entertaining first game of the tournament, I have to say. Library of Alexandria there drawn for Jeff. Completely useless. Roy also just passing the turn. There's a Suchi, of course, an all-star here in the Swedish format. And I wonder if he's kind of forced to, uh, to flip on it. Nope, Disenchant. And there you see the weakness of Suchi in a format where a lot of decks are playing Disenchant and Swords. You basically have eight answers to one creature. There's a crack. Oh, are we going to see a Brain Geyser? Yeah, this. if it is a Brain Geyser, it's a huge game changer, Brain Geyser. This could give Jeff the victory. I think a Brain Geyser for eight because he cracked the Lotus, right? Okay, he's going to Brain Geyser for seven. Yeah, and he's got the Loa as well. Oh, this is disgusting. 
I think if I would be Roy, I would now use the Chaos Orb. Exactly, I would flip right now. Roy, flip the Chaos Orb. Flip it on the Loa. Oh, he's not doing it though. The reason I would flip here is that, you know, if Roy wants to flip now, he responds. Exactly, so he already has that free card. If you would have done that before the Brain Guys are resolved, then at least he wouldn't have a card or an active Loa. Also, if you do it now, you have a chance of running into a disenchant with the Chaos Orb. But I guess Roy is not really interested in that at all. He's just thinking, you know what? I'm going to use Chaos Orb against a, a creature threat, something that can kill me, I guess. I mean, he already has the card advantage. I'm just going to accept that. But it's looking really, really, really good for Jeff. I mean, that balance play and then finding that Brain Geyser, that was, of course, huge for Jeff. Uh, swinging in for two here, by the way, so... Is Roy going to take this damage? Is he thinking about flipping? Exactly, I, that would surprise me. Taking the damage, going to 10. And I mean, Roy only having one lonely card in hand. It's looking so bad for him. Sarah Angel there in hand for Jeff. Could consider playing it out. Going for the Suchi first, it seems. Of course, the um, Sarah being more... Um, more precious real estate, so maybe wants to first play out the Suchi, see if it can take some removal and then play out the Sarah. There we see the Suchi. Do believe he's now tapping five for the Suchi, by the way, if I'm not mistaken. Or am I missing something? Okay, he is gonna flip on the Suchi. Yeah, this is kind of the scenario that Jeff was hoping for, and uh, it's a flip. A lot of rotation there for uh, for Roy, but I think Roy kind of sees the writing on the wall. It's like, it's gonna be super tough to get back from this. And like I said, I think I would, but then I probably still would have lost, because I mean, Roy, there's really no coming back from this, but I think I would have flipped on the Loa in response to the Brain Geyser, which again, it's not ideal. You're still gonna lose, but but knowing Roy, who's a very good player, he probably has its reasons not to and, and choose to use the Chaos Orb on a creature instead. Here we see a Sarah Angel. And a Jeff Plant's really working out, right? First kind of play the bait. Then again, it both deals four points of damage. And here we see a Juzam Jin number three. It's still fun to see a Juzam, even if you're back against the wall. There we see a Swords, though. And yeah, it's not surprising that Jeff has all the answers after a Brain Geyser and having that active Loa as well. I wonder how many cards he has right now. Oh, this is disgusting. This is disgusting. Also finding that mind twist. There's at least the swords to plowshares. And Jeff is actually going to counter that away. I think he's got enough mana to do that. And then Roy will be forced to tap down his City of Brass. Taking an extra point of damage, but the Sarah Angel lives. So he can attack, I guess, with both. Half his life total, go from 12, drop down to 6. And yeah, there's really nothing Roy can do here. This is a slaughterhouse. But the good news for Roy is it's just game number one. Look at that, picking up the cards. And both players are going to dive into their sideboards. And we will catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So Roy on the play. I believe Jeff again took a mulligan, so has to decide what card to put on the bottom. Ooh, look at that. I think he took, he put the Black Lotus on the bottom. Taking it back though, going for the Spirit Link instead. So Spirit Link on the bottom. Roy here starting with a Mox Jet and a Scrubland, passing the turn. So next turn, if we can find a land, potentially could play if not Spectre. There we see a Tundra and that Black Lotus from Jeff and a pass. There's another Black. Are we going to see the Hypnotic Spectre hitting the board? The famous Hippie? Or something else? Ooh, an Underworld Dreams. Okay. Underworld Dreams can put some pressure on as well. So that means for every card that Jeff draws, he takes the damage. Going to drop to 19. Going to play a Mistress Factory. And, ooh, he's got a Mind Twist in hand. I didn't see that Mind Twist. Oh, man. Oh, look at that. Roy losing his own Mind Twist. And, I mean, this is the thing. Mind Twist is so incredibly good if you have a card like Black Lotus to combine it with. Or, of course, Dark Ritual. Oh, man, because that's just pure card advantage. And, and 
I feel for Roy, you know, if you think of game one, he was unlucky, and now in game two, getting that early twist. It's not done yet, but it's going to be difficult for him. There's the attack for two. It's going to drop to 18 and a pass. So Jeff actually not playing out that Savannah line, which I believe he has in hand. Going a little bit slower, going underground C. Perhaps he wanted to keep the red elemental blast in hand, attacking for two. Now we do see the Savannah line hitting the board. And uh, Roy on 16, Jeff on 17, of course, because of the points uh, points of damage taken by the Underworld Dreams. Probably going to swing in for four again. Yep, just going to attack for four, so uh, taking the risk with the Factory. Factory is going to die here to a Swords to Plowshare, so that means uh, two points up for Jeff. Going to go to 18 and two points down for Roy. He's now on 14. There's a maze and a pass. It's just looking really, really good here again for Jeff. I guess the good news for Roy is that the only pressure on the board is that lion. So if we can just play, for example, a black knight, that would be quite good. Roy dropping to 12. But of course, he's uh, trying to find the cards from the top of his deck after that mind twist. Two cards in hand, I believe, for Roy at the moment. Taking more damage from the lion. Dropped to 10 already. There's another duel, passing the turn, and Roy really needs to find something from the top. Okay, there's a strip, and there's a Juzam. Okay, it was keeping the Juzam in hand that makes sense because of that maze. Found the strip. Ah, there's a sword though. Yeah, it's just unfortunate. Every time Jeff has the right answers. He's on 15 at the moment. There's a Sapphire. There's the attack, so uh, Roy also on 15, but now on 13, of course, after the attack by the Savannah Lions. But it's not over yet. Two cards in hand for both players. There's a balance. Okay, taking care of the hand here of Jeff. The hand's not that dangerous, but you're also killing that line, so I think it's a very good balance. Disenchant, of course, played out here on the Underworld Dreams. So five lands for Jeff and four lands for Roy, so we'll also have to... Uh, to the land into the graveyard and I mean now we've got a game now we're top decking again there's a factor okay that's some pressure Roy passing turn uh, library of Alexandria yeah that is that is unfortunate there's another factory so now he can swing in for three gonna put the Roy on ten okay there's a factory for Roy There's another Mox here for Jeff. I wonder, yeah, going to animate both, offering the trade. I wonder if he's going to take it. Remember, he cannot pump it up yet because it's still a summoning sickness. He is taking the trade. Going to drop to eight. Going to draw for turn, play a Swamp, pass turn, probably going to drop to six. At least that's most likely. Exactly, gonna drop to six. And oh, Sarah Angel. So Jeff is simply top decking better here than Roy in game two. And now you gotta go and jump with your Hypnotic Spectre. It's not really what you wanna do in life. There's a pass. Ooh, he's also gonna attack here. So kind of offering the trade. Roy is taking. He's like, you know what? I'm gonna take the risk, hopefully, finding a Sengir or a Swords from the top. Needs something useful. At least something that flies. There's a Juzam. Okay, that is cool. <laughs> Roy ending it in style with a Juzam Jin, but it's not going to save him. And a Jeff winning here 2 0 in round number one of the Raging Bull series. What an entertaining opening match. Again, Jeff, congratulations for winning round number one. Now, this was just round number one. Next week, we will be back with more action from the Raging Bull series with round number two. We've got Mono Green by Wouter taking on a pink mid-range deck by Vicente. So that action is coming next week. And if you don't want to miss a thing, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell because then you'll, get, you'll be notified whenever I upload something new. And talking about that stuff, it would also be great if you could like, comment, and share this on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. I mean, YouTube loves that stuff. So if you've got a moment, please do that for me. Thank you so much. And talking about things you can do for the channel, you can also become, of course, a patron of the show. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks for all the information. And if you become a supporter at the $2 tier or up, 
Your name will be also mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. Thank you to Samba Kazi.